Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I am Alex Michelson, and two of our favorites are back this week for round two of their big debate. Brian Tyler Cohen on the left, Tommy Lahren on the right. Tommy, of course, one of the best-known conservatives in the digital space. She's the author of Never Play Dead, How the Truth Makes You Unstoppable. Her first thoughts, her final thoughts, pretty much all of her thoughts can be seen every day on Fox Nation, which is Fox News' streaming service. Brian Tyler Cohen is one of the most followed progressive voices online. His commentaries and podcasts have been seen by tens of millions of people. You can check out his content on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc. under the handle at Brian Tyler Cohen and his podcast, No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen. Welcome back to both of you. Last time you were here, hey. right before the election, it was our most viewed episode ever on TV and online, seen by millions of people. Uh, so it's good to have you both back on The Issue Is. Thanks for having us. It's good to be back. I always love to see my California friends from afar here in Nashville, Tennessee, and glad I'm not in California. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's start with with some of that uh, that you're you're talking about, which is the the coronavirus, which continues to be the biggest issue in the country. We are seeing cases exploding. Clearly, something isn't working. So the question is: Do we need more restrictions? Do we need less restrictions? Tommy, what do you think? <laughs> I think you probably already know my answer, Alex. <laughs> I'm all about freedom. I'm all about trusting people with their own health and safety decisions. And I have to say, you know, California was the first to lock down. And since it's really been the last to reopen, if you don't count New York, I mean, you guys have gone back and forth with opening and then pulling the rug out from underneath of your residence there with your lovely governor, Gavin Newsom. But if your leadership was, was so uh, excellent and so effective and the lockdowns were so effective, you wouldn't have to do it again. You wouldn't have the highest case numbers in the country. You wouldn't have the issues that you're seeing now. Clearly, what you're doing is not working. And by destroying your economy, destroying people's businesses, destroying their livelihoods, and restricting their free movements and their ability to operate or go to a job, that's not solving a problem for anyone, and it's certainly not solving your case numbers. So uh, I don't think treating people like caged animals is the way to go. Of course, we do have 40 million people in California, more than any other state, so it would be natural that we might have more cases. In terms of cases per 100,000, we're actually doing among the best in the country. But clearly there's a huge problem, Brian, when it comes to hospitals and ICUs, which seem overrun in many parts of the state. Yeah, I mean, look... The, the answer is right in the question that you asked. Cases are exploding. This is not the time to, to give up unless your goal is letting people die. Despite what people like Tommy claim, this isn't about shutting down the economy. It's about shutting down the virus. Okay, the, the only reason that we're here in the first place is because Trump refused to acknowledge the severity of the virus. And the rest of the GOP, all of whom are too afraid to confront him, they towed the party line. And so what we're left with is 300,000 dead Americans, the fourth biggest mass casualty event in American history. We're losing a 9-11's worth of people every single day. So when you ask if the restrictions are too much, no, because we should be willing to accept a disruption to our lifestyles to keep people alive. So what more restrictions would you want to see, Brian? It's, it's not about more restrictions. It's, it's about maintaining the restrictions that, are, that ultimately proved to be helpful to the American people. Uh, you know, the right wants to frame this as if it's some scary, tyrannical government takeover. But this is about keeping people alive. It's about pe keeping people like my parents alive, who are both healthcare workers, whose lives are put in infinitely more danger because people like Tommy advocate for going out as if everything is totally fine. Every time that people uh, like Tommy push back against these restrictions, advocate for people to push back against stay-at-home orders, advocate for politicizing the use of masks, it just makes it more difficult. She's, in fact, just entrenching the very thing that she claims to be fighting against. Tommy? So I would love to respond because I love how Brian likes to pin not only the virus on Donald Trump, but now clearly on myself. So he thinks that by people staying in their homes and looking out their windows, we're going to eradicate the virus. That's really not how it works, buddy, because if it did, we wouldn't be in, what, month nine of this now? How long do you want to lock down? And I also find it interesting that you and people like you conveniently ignore the fact that suicide rates are up, domestic violence rates are up, people have lost everything, their businesses, many businesses will be permanently shuttered. 
Does that not matter to you? I would also like to point to the facts and the science that you liberals seem to love so much and understand the fact that this virus has a between a 97 and a 99.7% survival rate. So you're going to destroy people's livelihoods, destroy the, the families and the businesses that they have built for generations. And many of these immigrant families, by the way, because I know that you liberals always claim to care about immigrant families, but especially in California, businesses, restaurants that they've cultivated. And you want to pull that all away for a virus that has between a 97 and 99 percent survival rate. And I would ask you again, of why you pin this on Donald Trump when he was the first one to shut down travel, something that you and people like you, since you like to refer to me and, and the right as people like me, said was bigoted and racist and, and, and xenophobic, by the way. So blaming this on Donald Trump is, is ridiculous. It is deflection. And again, I would say if your governor was doing so well, you wouldn't be in the space that you're in. But you want to lock people in their homes and their cages and have them look out the window. And I will say this, and I will end with this. If you're scared, stay home. If you don't want to infect the elderly or the most at risk, don't be around the elderly and the most at risk. And if you are elderly or most at risk, you're probably one of those people that needs to stay home. Everybody else, they're losing a hell of a lot more than just their health. They're losing everything by these lockdowns and these restrictions. Brian? So if I can respond, yeah. Here's the thing. The reason that we're struggling is because unlike every other country in the world, there's no relief. Democrats passed the HEROES Act in May that would give individuals $1,200 checks uh, that would also offer state and local funding. And it's been languishing on Mitch McConnell's desk ever since. So when you complain that, that people are hurting, you're right. And the only person that could help those people isn't, isn't willing to lift even a finger. So if you're actually concerned with helping the people that you pretend to care about, take it up with Mitch McConnell and the rest of the GOP. The second point I'll make is that Tommy uh, uh, speaks about the fact that there's a 97% survival rate. So what she's basically saying is that she's willing to sacrifice 3% of the population because God forbid she can't go out and live life as if nothing is different whatsoever, which is especially ironic considering, like we spoke about last time, this is somebody who has fallen over herself to wail about how terrible Benghazi was when four Americans have died. Now she's willing to sacrifice 3% of the population because she can't go out and live completely normal as if there's no pandemic. And finally, the last point I'll make uh, with regard to Trump and his, and his uh, wonderful handling of this virus, Tommy, you're not just lying. You are obliterating reality. Trump did not respond effectively. He did not shut down the country. He did not take decisive action. He didn't save millions of lives. Trump pretended it wasn't real. He said it was contained, that cases would go down to zero, that it would go away with heat, that it would miraculously disappear. He said anyone who wants a test could get a test when they couldn't. He fomented protests against stay-at-home orders. He tried to get businesses and schools and restaurants to reopen, and the states that followed his lead saw their death rates skyrocket to the highest rates in the planet. South Dakota has a one in three infection rate. Donald Trump oversaw a response that has the most cases and the most deaths in the world. We have 4% of the world's population, 20% of the world's deaths. We don't live in a vacuum. All you have to do is look at literally any other country in the world, and you'd see that we are not doing well. And certainly not when you consider that we fashion ourselves the greatest country on the face of the earth. So uh, I don't know what audience you talk to. I would love to respond to, to Alex to, because yeah. I think we're just kind of yeah. on a, on a right. ramble. I would love to respond Tommy, to Tommy, go just ahead. And my guess is, uh, my, my guess made. is Speaker Pelosi is going to bear some responsibility in this when you talk, Tommy. <laughs> Yeah, well, beyond that, I would like to respond to his first point that he made, that this is Mitch McConnell's fault. I will say this. Yes, both sides need to come up with relief for the American people. But a lot of American <laughs> isn't people... It isn't it funny that, how... I know, isn't okay, it funny wait, how, my turn, my turn. Yeah, let, my let, turn, let, her, my let turn. her speak, Brian. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. You know, if I was a liberal, I would call you a sexist, but good thing I'm not. Um, moving forward, so you want to blame Mitch McConnell for this. And again, I will say this. Many Americans, although they are struggling right now and they do need relief, many Americans would like to get relief by reopening their businesses and living their lives, not waiting for a government check. They don't want to be dependent and reliant upon the almighty government, a.k.a. the almighty taxpayer. They want to be able to open their businesses and be able to get back to normal and make a living for themselves, not wait for the next handout. So that's first and foremost. So if we're, we want to go into that, I'll make that one short and sweet. And then second, you want to talk about the failures of Donald Trump? The one who brought our vaccine in record time in warp speed, which your party said was impossible. You said it would have to be a miracle. This president oversaw a successful 
rollout of the vaccine for those who want to take it. So before you want to go and blame Donald Trump for casualties and deaths because of a pandemic and because of a virus, you should take a look at the incredible work that he was able to do within the administration to roll out that vaccine, which I know that you won't acknowledge, but you'll probably be the first one to put your arm out and get one. You can count me out on that, All right. by the way. We, we could, we could so stay let, on let this. Me just ask you, let me just ask a quick question. Really if I can, quickly. Uh, Alex. Sure. Um, so I, I guess my question would be, so Tommy, you do think that Donald Trump's uh, response to this virus has been overall a success? I do. I think that when you have a vaccine so, rollout so, as fast as you have a vaccine rollout under this administration, then yes, this was a global pandemic that nobody was ready for. In fact, I think we should have cut off travel to China and from China sooner. But I think our president three, has done 300,000 dead He's, Americans. 300,000 Ameri dead Americans and 3,000 dying every single day, Tommy would consider that a success. I would again like to remind you that this has a night between 97 and 99.75 percent <clears throat> survival rate. So no, any life loss is a tragedy. And I want to move on because we have a lot of other topics yeah. that I'd like to ask All you right. about, Brian. Any death is a tragedy. But when you have a survival rate as high as that and you've got people losing everything and you fail to acknowledge suicide rates, domestic violence, and people absolutely losing their, their in-person education. They have lost connection with their family members. You think that that is unimportant. I happen to think it is. All right, I, Tommy, I know you, you are not happy with the way that California Governor Gavin Newsom has responded to this. Uh, there's now a recall petition, uh, about half the signatures necessary to get that on the ballot. Uh, polls show he's still largely popular in, in a pretty deeply blue state of California. Do you think this thing has a real chance? 100 percent and i am so proud of californians for finally waking up and realizing the tyranny that has been in their backyard for years but now the coronavirus edicts and mandates and restrictions and lockdowns have just made it abundantly clear by the way i think we're showing photos of your illustrious governor there breaking his own mandates and edicts because he and his aunt nancy don't think that they need to follow their own rules so again, when you're a hypocrite like that, when you go to the French Laundry and you spend thousands and thousands of dollars while your state is suffering and your constituents are suffering, you're going to get recalled. And I believe it's going to happen. Brian? Yeah, first off, Tommy has about as much say in recalling the California governor as I do in recalling the Queen of England. But here's the thing. Emergency powers were given to the governor for an emergency situation. And if the fourth largest mass casualty event in U.S. history isn't an emergency, I don't know what is. And look, yeah, life is hard right now. Things are bad throughout the entire country. But the reason they're bad is because instead of, instead of taking this virus seriously in the beginning, all we got was denialism from the GOP. When that party, the party in charge, should have been working to contain it, they followed Trump's lead and downplayed it and pretended it wasn't real. They allowed it to explode throughout this country. So instead of focusing your energy on a doomed recall effort, that you and I and Alex and everyone watching knows is going absolutely nowhere, maybe focus your energy on taking these simple steps that could actually help contain this virus instead of complaining that your freedoms are being trampled by the people whose only goal is to actually help people survive. The longer that we protest, uh, uh, thanks to people like Tommy, the longer this is going to remain a hardship for people. Well, I, I mean, look, I, I think the recall is unlikely, but I don't know necessarily that it's going nowhere. I mean, we did have a recall in 2003 of a Democratic governor of California, um, and different, stranger different things world have happened. Between, uh, yeah, I mean, there, stranger things have happened, but it's a different world between 2003 and 2020. It, it is a different yeah, world, and there's more Democratic voters voter now. But and ballot harvesting, right, Brian? <laughs> got to make sure that those elections stay the way you want them to with your ballot harvesting let's, and no signature verification. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm let's sure talk we're going to talk fraud. about it. Don't let's, you all right. worry, Well, sir. let's 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 bring up that issue, which is which is the issue of, of voter fraud, because the last time that we were together was right before the election. The big debate at that time was Trump versus Biden. Uh, at this point, we now have had uh, the Electoral College has spoken uh, for Joe Biden. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has acknowledged that Joe Biden is the president-elect. Uh, Tommy, is it time for President Trump to concede? I don't think it's time for President Trump to concede until we get an actual investigation into election integrity and voter fraud. And it's funny because the Democrats, I seem to remember four years ago, spent four years investigating this president fruitlessly and wasting our taxpayer dollars on their investigation. But now all of a sudden they don't believe in investigating. They want to turn the other cheek, pretend that it didn't happen. And uh, they scoff at bringing up election integrity or maintaining the integrity of our elections, which is incredibly rich given <clears throat> they spent four years doing that very thing.
Brian? Yeah, okay. A few points I want to cover here. The first is that, uh, look, I get that Trump wants to continue crying frauds, that he can keep grifting his supporters into donating and paying down his campaign debt. Uh, it's because he also wants to, uh, because he's groomed his supporters into believing that there's nothing worse than a loser, and that's exactly what he's become. Uh, beyond that, this is what Trump does. He cried fraud during the Iowa caucus. He cried fraud during the 2016 general before he won. The 2016 general after he won, he cried fraud about the Emmys. The guy literally broadcast that he would say the election was rigged if he lost, and that's exactly what he's doing. This is what Trump does. Uh, beyond that, if there's, any, if, if there's any legitimate evidence of fraud, they'd have presented it in court. This, that is quite literally where the, the, the fraud issues are adjudicated, and yet not in any of the 59 cases that Trump and his allies have brought forward has a single evidence of fraud been proven. This whole last month has been a legal shellacking for the Trump team. The only reason that, that Republicans and Tommy like to make these claims is that it was never about winning in a court of law. It was about winning in the court of public opinion. But, but Tommy, it's about manipulating people into, into believing a disinformation campaign. Tommy, to, to Brian's point, why is there only fraud in the states that Trump lost? Well, when you look at swing states, I think it's very important to understand that we have legitimate questions that need to be answered. How does their mail-in ballot drops in the middle of the night after voting was uh, which they tell us that they stop counting and then the middle of the night they have thousands and thousands of ballots that come in that are exclusively for joe biden and then you have the Dominion yeah, voting to, machine. i'd love to answer by that. the way by the why why does he interrupt me every time i'm speaking yeah, okay again if i were a liberal i'd call you a sexist okay. but i'm not thank you go goodness. ahead Tommy. but again when you have they did a forensic imaging of the dominion voting machines in atrium county and they did find through that investigation that there were major problems with those voting machines and those were used in 24 different states so yes we need an audit of the vote we need to make sure that we have signature verification you can't just send in ballots with signatures that you're not going to verify that all say joe biden on it and call it a day no we have legitimate reason to question with the, the mass mail-in voting that was brought on by the Democrats under the guise of coronavirus, we have legitimate reason to question it. And you know, being in the state of California, that not only do you have mail-in voting that you had for a long time, you have ballot harvesting with no signature verification. And you want to tell me that that's safe and secure? Then you take that California model and you spread it all around the country and you expect people like me to sit up or sit down and shut up and not talk about voter fraud? No. No, I'm very well aware of what goes on in California and how the Democratic Party was able to spread that around the nation. But, but quickly, to quickly Tommy, as a, as a follow-up to that, why, if that's such a Democratic advantage, did Republicans do so well when it comes to congressional seats in California? Uh, Donald Trump obviously lost here big, but Republicans won big on those very same ballots. Well, California is an issue and an aside from that. We're talking about the swing states. Trump was never going to win California. I think we're all aware of that. But we're talking about these swing states that had voting stop in the middle of the night, ballot drops, mail-in ballot drops, and with no signature verification. If you're not going to verify the signatures and you want to have mass mail-in voting with no signature ver verification, how is that unreasonable for people like me and for other, other Trump supporters to question that? How is that unreasonable? Brian, Brian quickly to you. Yeah, I, I would love to answer this. Uh, okay, so first of all, what, when, when you describe a ballot dump, that's not evidence of fraud. It's literally votes being counted. All votes are counted in batches. They're never counted one by one. And when and those votes come in from, from, from excuse me, excuse me, Tommy, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, but yeah. I'm actually sleeping, uh, speaking right now. So when those votes come in from Democratic population centers like cities, Democrats' numbers go up. That's not fraud just because those votes are for Democrats. Second of all, the issue of uh, no signature verification, that's completely false. In Georgia, there's the signature is not only verified the first time when when the absentee ballot request comes in against the voter registration file, it's then verified again when the actual ballot is returned. So when you say that there's no there's no signature verification, you are lying. The courts have said there's no fraud. Donald Trump's own appointed judges have said there's no fraud, including his appointed judges in Georgia, Wisconsin, the Third Circuit, the Eleventh Circuit, and the Supreme Court. Uh, Bill Barr's DOJ has said there's no fraud. Chris Krebs and the DHS's cybersecurity unit have said there's no fraud. Republican governors and Republican secretaries of state have said there's no fraud. And even Rudy Giuliani himself admitted in court that there there was no claims to fraud. So I don't know what you're talking about no when you say fraud, fraud other than this Republican fever dream that you're dealing with right now. Last word, Tommy. Yeah, I would also, I would like more forensic imaging on your Dominion voting <laughs> systems and tabulations. I would like more what forensic imaging. Is that too much to ask? 
you have nothing what to add? What about the rest of the claims? Well, what about the rest of the claims? What about, the 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 what about no sig- are, you, you said there was no signature are, verification the in Georgia. The there is. Fighting, aren't the Democrats the ones that are fighting that for the runoff, that they don't want triple A signature verification? Isn't that the Democrats that the don't Democrats want that in on the exact, the, the Democrats right. are keeping the exact same, the exact same uh, uh, procedures that, have, that were there uh, passed by that Republican-led state in the regular general election. So, I, again, I don't know what you're talking about. You brought up all these claims of fraud, and then you're not actually able to back them up. This is just – you're just spouting platitudes. All right. Let, let, let's talk for a moment uh, about – you guys both brought up Georgia. Let's do these as quick takes, hopefully, because <laughs> we can keep going all day long. Uh, Georgia runoff. A lot at stake there. Um, it's going to determine control of the Senate. Big picture, what's the biggest difference for the country if there's a Democratic control versus Republican control? Brian, quick take to you. Sure. Uh, if Democrats control the Senate, guarantee you the first order of business is going to be relief to the American people, stimulus checks, uh, $15 minimum wage, federally decriminalized marijuana, expanded access to health care, which is especially important now with this pandemic, um, and codifying protections for women's reproductive rights, which I know Tommy supports even if she advocates for a party that is actively trying to strip her of those rights. Tommy, biggest difference if Republicans stay in control. Uh, if Republicans stay in control, then we we are able to keep socialism from knocking on our door. I mean, it's still going to be a fight, but at least if we maintain control of the Senate, at least we can keep socialism pushed back for a while. If the Democrats take control, you're going to have socialist policies. You're going to have a Green New Deal. You're going to have uh, Planned Parenthood pulling the strings and making. And again, I'm I'm someone who's pro-choice, but I don't believe that the American taxpayer should be footing the bill for people's abortion. So I just want to clarify that with Brian, because he seems to have mistaken that about my stance there. But again, I I think it's just a very clear decision. Are we going to be a socialist nation? Are we going to be a free nation? That's your choice in Georgia. Uh, Another quick take. Hunter Biden in the news uh, recently. Um, He's being investigated by the U.S. Attorney's Office. The Bidens say he did nothing wrong. Tommy, what do you make of this, the the media attention of this so far, and why do you think this is a big deal? You mean the lack of media attention? The right. lack of media attention. Yeah, I mean, it has not gotten a lot really of media should attention. Be discussing. No, it absolutely has not. And again, the Democrats love investigations unless it's one of their own. The Democrats love investigations unless it doesn't turn out well for them. So, yes, we absolutely need a special prosecutor to make sure. And I think they're going to uncover a lot of good stuff, by the way, because we've already seen it. They're going to uncover a lot. There is a probe. There is an investigation, whether Brian and, and people like him want to deny it or not. Hunter Biden is under investigation. So is Joe Biden's brother. When you're getting $6 million from a Chinese energy company, not to mention that Burisma money from Ukraine, when you have your uh, then vice president in charge of Ukraine policy, yeah, there's a lot to uncover there. So I would love to be, you know, I'd love to see Brian be a good Democrat and and want that investigation. Brian? (laughs) This is what happens when the right finally runs out of Hillary Clinton content after a decade. I'll tell you what, we we can have a good faith conversation about Hunter Biden as soon as we have a conversation about Jared Ivanka reporting $135 million in 2018 while working in the White House, uh, Don Jr. and Eric making $110 million in real estate despite no new deals while their father is in office, Jared what about Kushner, so he, so he doesn't uh, intervening want to in a blockade. Again, so you're great. You're Excuse just like me, the Tommy, media, I'm so, so sorry, but I'm actually, if, yeah, I, if well, I can just oh, finish, no, if I can just finish. It. Let him finish. Tommy, Tommy, you can play when he can. You can play when he interrupted you. Yeah, no, there, there's, some, there's, some more, there's some more issues that I want to talk about. Jared Kushner intervening in a blockade dispute after Qatar's finance minister uh, uh, refused to invest in his family's property, 666 Fifth Avenue, Ivanka getting her trademarks granted in, by China, Eric shifting money away from a kid's cancer charity. They can't even run a charity in New York, this family. And now we have reporting that Kushner helped sh- set up a, a shell corporation so that money could be funneled from taxpayers to the Trump family. So it's like the collective Republican Party was all reborn this week and conveniently forgot the last four years. And look, I- I'm not here to carry water for anyone who did anything illegal, and that's including Hunter Biden. In, in either party, if you broke the law, you should be held to account for it. But this is definitely so, not a good faith conversation. A special prosecutor for Hunter Biden, because you spent a lot of time on what about isms again, talking about the Trump family. Well, then, and, I mean, if well, you're president, answer the elect question. Joe Biden. I mean, were you? So, so let me just no, ask no, you a question. I, that if, wasn't if, actually, if I say, Brian, if I say, wasn't the if, question, if, Brian. The yeah. question was about so if I say Hunter that if I say that I'm, per- if, I'm if I say that I'm perfectly acceptable for uh, for if Hunter Biden did something wrong if any legitimate investigation finds that he did something wrong then I'm perfectly acceptable for him to be held account held to account because I'm not here what to carry Joe? water what for Hunter Biden guy? or anybody would you would you uh, 
Okay. Are you saying Joe Biden? This, the big guy. Yeah, the big guy that they needed okay. to get. Joe Biden wasn't accused. Joe Biden wasn't accused of anything. This and if is, you want to talk about a big guy, what why don't you what, what investigation into Donald Trump or his family for all of those things that I just named would you support? None, because it's not about actually getting you to the bottom of any legitimate issue. It's about being a partisan this okay. for these this people. Is, this is going well. So I think we're, we're all going to agree that we're going to disagree on this topic. But I, I do want to find some places where we might agree, because we do like to have some fun on uh, the issue is. So we got Tommy Laren, Brian Tyler Cohen here. Let's play some personal issues. And this time, since it is holiday season, uh, we have an entirely holiday themed questions. We're going to put 30 seconds up on the clock. So this is real quick. Give us a quick answer. The first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, and maybe, maybe we'll see an area of agreement here. All right, we ready? Here we go. Uh, Tommy, let's start with you. What's your favorite holiday movie? Christmas Vacation. Brian. Elf. What is your favorite holiday song, Brian? Oh, uh, uh, oh my God, do I have to be, I, I don't know. I, I, the only thing I, that's coming to my mind right now is, uh, is, is Mariah Carey because it's just the only thing that the, the, floods the The most the popular one of all time. All I want for Christmas is, all right, uh, Tommy, favorite song. Hey, I'm gonna go ahead and agree. That's a classic song. There we go. Mariah bringing everybody together. And last question is kind of fun. <laughs> Best or worst gift you've ever gotten, Tommy? Best gift, you know, I don't even exchange gifts with my family anymore. I have everything that I need. So for me, the worst gift would be to give me a gift because I need nothing. I actually would encourage people to donate something to an animal shelter. That's a personal issue of mine. And I know that Brian and I share that in common. Yes. I, I will agree with Tommy there. I think that would be a great idea if you could donate donate to animal shelters the holidays. Look at this. All right. We're finding some some room of agreement here on the issue is. And, and we also want to look forward. The next game is called The Issue Will Be. Uh, so we're looking forward to 2021 with Tommy Laren and Brian Tyler Cohen. And Brian, let's start with you. What do you think is going to be the most important story of 2021? Yeah, I, I think uh, getting the pandemic under control and uh, more broadly, yet another recovery from a disastrous Republican administration. It's 2008 all over again, where the GOP tanks the economy and, and, and sheds jobs and Democrats have to come in and pick up the pieces. Tommy, I'm sure that's going to be an area of agreement, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I mean, if uh, Joe Biden is sworn in as president, I think that the biggest thing is going to be how long that he remains president until they nudge him out of the way and put Kamala in there, their plan from the get-go. So we'll wait and watch for that one. I give it six months. Okay. We're, we're going to hold that tape. And then if it's six months, he's still in there. We'll remind you of that. Um, and, and functioning and cognitive. Yeah. But. Okay. It, 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 in the spirit of the holidays and bringing people together, we want to give each of you a chance uh, for, for a holiday greeting. Uh, Tommy, let's start with you. What what is entailed by a holiday greeting? You know, the good wishes, I a happy new say, year. How about this? I would say Merry Christmas because we're finally allowed to say that again because our president is Donald <laughs> J. Trump. <laughs> okay, Brian, to you. I would say not only Merry Christmas, which we've always been allowed to say, uh, but happy holidays to everybody no matter what you celebrate and uh, my family especially who I won't be able to see this year because we're trying to keep everybody safe. Uh, a happy holidays to both of you. Here's what I really love about both of you. Um, I think we had a, a it was feist, feisty at times, but a civil dialogue that was respectful. I think more people in this country need to actually have the ability to talk with people that they disagree with and have an exchange. Thank you both for doing that. Thank you both for what you do. Uh, and I appreciate both of you, especially during this holiday season. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having us. Always a good time. Thanks so much. Enjoy California and your recall. <laughs> I want to wish all of our viewers a very happy holidays. We're back next week with one of my favorite interviews that we've ever done. It's with Emmanuel Acho, author of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Until then, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>